Roughing It by Mark Twain. The secretary and I took quarters in the ranch of a worthy French lady by the name of Bridget O'Flanagan, a camp follower of His Excellency the Governor. She had known him in his prosperity as Commander-in-Chief of the Metropolitan Police of New York, and she would not desert him in his adversity as Governor of Nevada. Our room was on the lower floor, facing the plaza, and when we had got our bed a small table, two chairs, the government fireproof safe, and the unabridged dictionary into it, there was still room enough left for a visitor, maybe two, but not without straining the walls. But the walls could stand it, at least the partitions could, for they consisted simply of one thickness of white cotton domestic stretched from corner to corner of the room. This was the rule in Carson, any other kind of partition was the rare exception. And if you stood in a dark room and your neighbors in the next had lights, the shadow on, the can on your canvas told queer secrets sometimes. Very often these partitions were made of old flour sacks basted together, and then the difference between the common herd and the aristocracy was that the common herd had unornamented sacks while the walls of the aristocrat were overpowering with rudimental fresco, i.e. red and blue mill brands on the flower sacks. Occasionally, also, the better classes embellished their canvas by pasting pictures from Harper's Weekly on them. In many cases, too, the wealthy and the cultured rose to spittoons and other evidences of a sumptuous and luxurious taste. Washu people take a joke so hard that I must explain that the above description was only the rule. There were many honorable exceptions in Carson. Plastered ceilings and houses that had considerable furniture in them. M.T. We had a carpet and a uh, we, we had a carpet and a genuine Queensware wash bowl. Consequently, we were hated without reserve by the other tenants of the O'Flanagan ranch. Ranch is always in quotations. When we added a painted oilcloth window curtain, we simply took our lives into our own hands. To prevent bloodshed, I removed upstairs and took up quarters with the untitled plebeians in one of the fourteen white pine cot bedsteads that stood in two long racks in the one sole room of which the second story consisted. It was a jolly company, the 14. They were principally voluntary camp followers of the governor, who had joined his retinue by their own election at New York and San Francisco and came along, feeling that in the scuffle for little territorial crumbs and offices, they could not make their condition more precarious than it was and might reasonably expect to make it better. They were popularly known as the Irish Brigade, though there were only four or five Irishmen among all the governor's retainers. His good-natured excellency was much annoyed at the gossip his henchmen created, especially when there arose a rumor that they were paid assassins of his, brought along to quietly reduce the democratic vote when desirable. Mrs. O'Flanagan was boarding and lodging them at ten dollars a week apiece, and they were cheerfully giving their notes for it. They were perfectly satisfied, but Bridget presently found that notes that could not be discounted were but a feeble constitution for a Carson boarding house. She, so she began to harry the governor to find employment for the brigade. <laughs> her, um, uh, him, her importunities and theirs together drove him to a gentle desperation at last and he finally summoned the brigade to the presence. Then, said he, Gentlemen, I have planned a lucrative and useful service for you, a service which will provide you with recreation and noble landscapes, and afford you never-ceasing opportunities for enriching your minds by observation and study. 
I want you to survey a railroad from Carson City westward to a certain point. When the legislature meets, I will have the necessary bill passed and the remuneration arranged. What? A railroad over the Sierra Nevada and the mountains? Well then, survey it eastward to a certain point. <laughs> He converted them into surveyors, chain bearers, and so on, and turned them loose in the desert. It was recreation with a vengeance. Recreation on foot, lugging chains through sand and sagebrush, under a sultry sun and among cattle bones, coyotes, and tarantulas. Romantic adventure could go no further. They surveyed very slowly, very deliberately, very carefully. They returned every night during the first week, dusty, footsore, tired and hungry, but very jolly. They brought in great store of prodigi prodigious hairy spiders, tarantulas, and imprisoned them in covered tumblers upstairs in the ranch. After the first week, they had to camp on the field, for they were getting well eastward. They made a good many inquiries inquiries as to the location of that indefinite certain point, but got no information. At last, to a peculiarly urgent inquiry of how far eastward, Governor Nye telegraphed back, to the Atlantic Ocean, blast you, and then bridge it and go on. This brought back the dusty toilers, who sent in a report and ceased from their labors. The governor was always comfortable about that. He said Mrs. O'Flanagan would hold him would hold him for the brigade's board anyhow, and he intended to get what entertainment he could out of the boys. He said with his old time pleasant twinkle that he meant to survey them into Utah and then telegraph Brigham to hang them for trespass. The surveyors brought back more tarantulas with them. And so we had quite a menagerie arranged along the shelves of the room. Some of these spiders could straddle over a common saucer with their hairy, muscular legs, and when their feelings were hurt, or their dignity offended. They were the wickedest-looking desperados the animal world can furnish. If their glass prison houses were touched ever so lightly, they were up and spoiling for a fight in a minute. Starchy? Proud, indeed, they would take up a straw and pick their teeth like a member of Congress. There was an, as usual, a furious zephyr blowing the first night of the brigade's return, and about midnight the roof of an adjoining stable blew, blew off, and a corner of it came crashing through the side of our ranch. There was a simultaneous awakening and a tumultuous muster of the brigade in the dark and a general tumbling and sprawling over each other in the narrow aisle between the bed rows. In the midst of the, tum of the turmoil, Bob H. Blank, we'll call him Bob Hope, sprung up out of a sound sleep and knocked down a shelf with his head. Instantly he shouted, Turn out, boys! The tarantulas is loose! No warning ever sounded so dreadful. Nobody t tried any longer to leave the room. Least he might step on a tarantula. Okay. It looks like tar tarantula. Every man groped for a trunk or a bed and jumped on it. Then followed the strangest silence. A silence of grisly suspense it was, too. Waiting, expectancy, fear. It was as dark as pitch and one had to imagine the spectacle of those fourteen scant-clad men roosting gingerly on trunks and beds, for not a thing could be seen. Then came occasional little interruptions of the silence, and one could recognize a man and tell his locality by his voice, or locate any other sound a sufferer made by his gropings or changings of position. The occasional voices were not given to much speaking, you simply heard a gentle ejaculation of ow, followed by a solid thump, and you knew the gentleman had felt a hairy blanket or something touch his bare skin, 
and had skipped from bed to the floor. Another silence. Presently you would hear a gra gasping voice say, S -s -s Something's crawling up the back of my neck. Every now and then you could hear a little subdued scramble and a sorrowful, Oh, Lord. And then you knew that somebody was getting away from something you took for a tarantula, and not losing any time about it, either. Directly a voice in the corner rang out wild and clear, I've got him! I've got him! Pause and probable change of circumstances. No, he's got me. Oh, ain't they never going to fetch a lantern? The lantern came at that moment in the hands of Mrs. O'Flanagan, whose anxiety to know the amount of damage done by the assaulting roof had not prevented her waiting a judicious interval after getting out of bed and lighting, and lighting up to see if the wind was done, now upstairs, or had a larger contract. The landscape presented when the lantern flashed into the room was picturesque, and might have been funny to some people, but was not to us. Although we were perched so strangely upon boxes, trunks, and beds, and so strangely attired, too, we were too earnestly distressed and too genuinely miserable to see any fud about it, and there was not the semblance of a smile anywhere visible. I know I, I am not capable of suffering more than I did during those few minutes of suspense in the dark, surrounded by those creeping, bloody-minded tarantulas. I had skipped from bed to bed and from box to box in, in a cold agony, and every time I touched anything that was fuzzy, I fancied I felt the fangs. I had rather go to war than live that episode over again. Nobody was hurt. The man who thought a tarantula had got him was mistaken. Only a crack in a box had caught his finger. Not one of those escaped tarantulas was ever seen again. There were ten or twelve of them. We took candles and hunted the place high and low for them, but with no success. Did we go back to bed then? We did nothing of the kind. We sat up the rest of the night playing cribbage and keeping a sharp lookout for the enemy. Chapter 22, The Son of a Nabob, Start for Lake Tahoe, Splendor of the Views, Trip on the Lake, Camping Out, Reinvigorating Climate, Clearing a Tract of Land, Securing a Title, Outhouse and Fences. It was the end of August, and the skies were cloudless, and the weather superb. In two or three weeks, I had grown wonderfully fascinated with the curious new country, and concluded to put off my return to the States a while. I had grown well accustomed to wearing a damaged slouch hat, blue woolen shirt and pants crammed into boot tops, and gloried in the absence of coat, vest, and braces. I felt rowdyish and bully, as the historian Josephus phrases it, in his fine chapter upon the destruction of the temple. It seemed to me that nothing could be so fine and so romantic. I had become